Hey, it's Danica Patrick. Enjoy this episode and use code Linux and save when you check out at GoDaddy.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. And welcome to the Arch Action Show. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Good hey. morning to you. Good morning. Good to have you back in studio. You made Good it around the bridge, huh? Made it across the bridge. Uh, um, Spidey sense was tingling. Yeah. A little web shoot, yeah. swung across, everything was good. You used Waze, didn't you? I used Waze, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, so we got a big show. Guess what? If you didn't know, we have a really big show today. Uh, coming up in the uh, second half of the show, Matt and I spent the week mm. in Arch. And now we're going to report to you our findings, our wins, our loses, and uh, some interesting ex- experiences with the community. It was an interesting experience, and I think you might be shocked by the results. Ooh, ooh, ooh I like that. Good tease, Matt. Of course, then in the news segment, we're going to run through some of the new features coming to GNOME 3.10. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, Mark Shuttleworth sat down and uh, marked off a bug. We're going to chat about that, and then John C. Dvorak decided to troll the Linux community, and we'll respond to that. <laughs> and then in the Slash Etsy segment, we asked you to send in some of your Let's Play videos, and uh, we'll roll through those and give away some Steam keys. We gave away two Steam keys last week. We're going to give away a few more this week yes. and maybe even give away a couple more next week. So Sweet. we'll have the details. And at the end of the show, it'll be the emails, the feedback, and stuff like that. All righty. I like All that. All right. So let's start with our picks, Matt, because it's a huge show. It's ridiculous. Big picks. Too big. Picks. big. big I want to start with the Runs Linux. This is just too awesome. Now, it doesn't run Arch Linux, but check it out. It's mm. a prosthetic knee, a new robotic wow. prosthetic knee. And look how awesome this is. Oh, man. This looks. is like absolutely bionic man awesome oh yeah this looks like you put this on i mean look at that look it's got a steel cable look at the the shocks on the thing i mean literally you don't have to worry about speed bumps if you're wearing this i mean clearly it's it's built for uh, shock absorption so here's here's the details matt if you could believe it this knee this replacement knee uh it it's um has a 400 watt commercially available brushless motor and is controlled by a Raspberry Pi as the computer host. Whoa. Yep. It's the first robotic prosthetics to run a full operating system install. It's running Debian, probably the uh, the Raspberry Pi right. uh, version of it, complete with wireless internet and USB ports. But here's... Okay, and then this is awesome. And now, being it's running, a, running off a Pi, could I get XBMC off my knee? Wow, man. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, is this possible? Can I? Can I get? You know, can I like put up a little computer monitor on my kneecap or something? I suppose that so. would be cool. I mean, because I mean, and that's a legitimate question. What What are the capabilities? How far can this really go? Does it control itself? What if it's goodness gracious? Well, and, and I would imagine because it has a full computer in there, you yeah. could hook it up and get diagnostics to see how it's been performing. Um, yeah. you oh know. no, that's cool. You could get some killer stats on that, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Maybe you could get some bar graphs off your knee. Oh man, that'd be cool. Uh, I, I am I am amazed that it, it's funny because when the Raspberry, I mean, this show was on the air when the Raspberry Pi right. project was announced. I never foresaw something like this. Well, it's so cool because it's it's now entering, you know, hey, wouldn't it be cool if to really practical, life-changing applications that's going to better someone's life? And I think that's yeah. really cool. It shows you how when, when, you, when you take real computing power and you bring mm-hmm. it down to a smaller... Uh, low power form factor, yeah. it opens up entire ranges for implementations of technology oh, that you never really even thought about. It's true. It just opens up this whole new level of creativity. So it's it's pretty incredible. Uh, it's coming from I, this. By the way, this uh, who somebody submitted this? Did I grab their name? It was submitted to the subreddit. Hmm. Let me see if I was a good guy and got that. Because sometimes I'm running so fast that I I forget to. But uh, no, see, waiting for it. Wait for it, Matt. Yes, uh, Captain oh. Flash Drive in the oh, subreddit wow. submitted Captain it. So Flash thank you. Drive. Good submission. Nice. Yes, thank you, Captain Flash Drive. All right. Yeah. For you Arch users out there, you might already know about this, but for you Arch noobs, I think you're really going to find our Android pick quite handy. Quite handy. Definitely. And then for those of you who want to capture a Let's Play or maybe do a walkthrough and capture your Linux desktop, mm-hmm. we've got a new app pick for you mm-hmm. that both Matt and I have played with a little bit this so week. So awesome. Yeah. So stay tuned for those. But first, Matt, first. I want to thank our sponsor, GoDaddy.com. Now, GoDaddy.com, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show. Kind of kind of going on, like, I think they've been sponsoring the Linux Action Show for about 125 years. Good. Does that, my does that sound like the right math to That you? sounds about right. My, and, my uh, time math, yeah. Because they've been sponsoring for so long, some of you know I have a, clo- a close personal relationship with mm-hmm. Danica Patrick. And I'm, I talked to her and I said, look, Danica, you've been giving us dot-coms for $2.49. It expires at the end of the month. You've been giving us 32% off anything in our shopping cart if it's our first order. 
these are incredible details, deep deals, but they all, all of them expire at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. I said, Danica, mm-hmm. I, I can't go on the Linux Action Show tomorrow. This is we're talking last night. We often do talk on this. We talk on Saturday. Late night yeah. uh, pillow talk, sure. I said, Danica, I can't go on the Linux Action Show tomorrow and not have a great deal. I, I cannot do that. You know what she said? She said, Chris, guess what? I got a great deal for you. I said, you do? What do you got? She said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to extend the Linux 249 code. So if somebody's getting a dot .com, when they check out over at GoDaddy.com, if they use the code Linux 249, they get that dot .com for $2.49. Wow. If you're getting started on a project, if you've got something where you want to collaborate with yeah. people, if you want to put up a web presence that maybe just redirects to your Google your Google Plus pl- uh, profile or your Facebook page, but you want to have your own .com, this is the chance to do it. Linux 249 gets you that .com for $2.49. But guess what? Wow. Guess what? That's, That's not deal. enough, Matt. That's not enough. That's not enough. I mean, we're still going for more? Gonna, Danica is bringing the rain, Matt. She's bringing the rain. She's making it rain. She's going to punch out even more savings. She's going to give us 35% off your entire Whoa. first order. She took it up from 32 to 35. Whoa. Just, Whoa. just use the code 35 off 2 when you check out. 35 off 2 gets you 35% off your entire order. You feel order. that? I feel the envelopes being pushed here. Yeah. I mean, that's a really that's yep. a really nice deal. Here's what I would do. Now, if you're okay. a, you know, don't this is what bad guy contractor does. Sure. You go you go buy a whole bunch of domains for your client. Right. You use you use that you use that go 32 or not go through to use 35 off to 35 yep. off to 35 off to okay you charge them the regular rate now i'm just saying it's oh, a little bit of a markup it saves but, you a little bit of money I, but you're pro- I mean, but you know you might be providing someone a service and you know you're this is what bad guy something, consultant something, does. Yeah, that's bad, bad. don't Naughty. listen to bad guy Naughty. consultant but you know Naughty. you could i mean listen do you think danica got as far as she did by playing by all the rules all the time yeah i don't think she so. drives their walls with a race car i mean come on little exactly little, right? exactly she's punching out the savings constantly so thank you to godaddy.com and a special shout out to my girl danica for bringing us the awesome, awesome savings. All right, Matt, let's go through it's some of our tough. picks. Woo-hoo. First pick this week is the Android pick. I bust out the old Note 2 here. Yeah. And I'll tell you, maybe you're setting yourself up an Arch install after you've been watching our mm-hmm. uh, our Arch challenge and yeah. our uh, episode. And you think, you know what? would like to have myself a little quick reference. And this actually could work even if you're not an Arch user. There's just a lot of really great info in the Arch wiki. And guess there, what? That's a great, great tool. And so, what, there's an what, arch. What, what's this going to do for me? What's this basically going to? Well, as oh, you I might see, expect, oh, yeah. Oh yeah. As yeah, you yeah. might expect, mm-hmm. it is the contents of the Arch Wiki in a much easier to understand oh, and digest yeah. form for your mobile device. And here I have uh, the Getting Started Guide up, and you can see right there. There's the Beginner's Guide, oh, see, Installation Guide, General Recommendations. And this is super handy, like huh. if, if you're reloading a laptop or you're, right. you're reloading your main machine. Hey, that's the key right there. You don't have a secondary computer to try and look to when it's like, oh, gosh, I forgot yeah. that one thing. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Also, it turns out there's just a ton of really um, – uh, some of the best documentation for Linux. I would I would e- easily say at least one of, if not the, yeah. that I in recent memory. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, I used to – even after I quit being a Gentoo user, I would still use – uh, Gentoo's wiki, and it's not like right. that with Arch. It's like even when I'm yeah. not using Arch, it's like ah, I think they covered that in the Arch wiki. And plus, it's free. That's right. It's a free app for your Android device. It's got uh, 83 five star ratings and nine four star ratings. It, it's it's, it's, it's a guy well app. rated. I mean, it's yeah. obviously it's a dynamite option. You know, they filed it in the uh, books and reference category. I agree with that. It very much mm-hmm. is right. I think that's very fair. You can also pull up the wiki news page here, which is great. So if you want to just check on that real quick, I like. Oh, that. nice. Yes, yeah. especially when you're considering updates. That's important. I'm not sure if it does updates or if it's just the wiki. I'll see. Oh, for it the news? Be. The news. A lot of times, I, my yeah. understanding in Arch users will There's a news me. page you yeah, can follow. You yeah. can kind of like, hey, just so yeah. you know, this is going to blah, yep. blah, 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 or yep. whatever. Sure. Well, we just did this new thing called System D. You might want to make sure you double check when yeah. you update. <laughs> just a little change. Yeah. So that little is like that. the Arch Wiki Viewer. It yep. is free in the Android Play Store, and we will mm-hmm. have a link to it in the show notes. Yes. Our desktop app pick this week is going to scratch that screen oh, recording yeah. itch you might have. It's called Simple Screen Recorder, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. it's a Linux program that was created to record your desktop, and it also has special support for OpenGL. Yes. Why don't I give a little demo of it since I have got it installed here yeah, on my machine? Yeah, rock okay. that sucker. So here it is, Simple Screen Recorder, mm-hmm. the SSR, as some people call it, and uh, very simple interface to use. So <clears throat> you have a couple of options here. Uh, you can do your whole screen, right? Yeah, sure. You can do one of the screens because I have two monitors hooked and up right now. that was awesome. I yep. was doing that myself. So you could have your that. notes on one monitor mm-hmm. and then your recording space on the other exactly. monitor. All the crap you don't want recorded goes <laughs> exactly. on the... Yeah. Right. Nice clean You could do a, f- a recorded fixed re- rectangle. I found this useful when I just wanted to capture my terminal. Right. So I just selected the terminal. And what's cool about it is when you say record a fixed rectangle, you can just say select window. Oh, so yeah. like if I have a terminal window open over here and I, and I say select window, it just... 
and I just exceed. and you don't have to trace that rectangle right. at that point. It gets it does it exactly. Yeah. So mm. let's say I wanted to do that, and what also I like is record microphone input. Right. So I can sit here and narrate to it as uh, we go. So I say continue. You can put it in. Uh, let's say you can put it in a MP4, MKV, and a WebM. I'm an MKV kind of guy. All right, let's do MKV, Matt, and then let's do a codec of. Uh, should we try VP8? I would probably do. Uh, let's do. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that's gonna be a safer. I'm deck. not gonna play. Let's do H264. Yeah. I, I I don't. And like what about your uh, your your rate? Are you gonna go 15, 30? What do you think? I I always do 30 frames do rate 30? because okay. that's how I live in in. Okay. And I'm a 30 frames per second kind of video guy. <laughs> so more of like a 15, 20 kind of fellow. But 24 cool. if you want that smooth. Uh, uh, video motion. Yes. I'm going to say my audio bit right there, AAC. Yeah. Um, good, point. good choice. That's, yeah. All right. Good so then choice. you uh, can just hit start recording. Now, here's what I like a lot. A couple of things. A, no matter what application you're in at this point, um, you're going to be able to do control R to stop the recording at any time. So nice. that's nice, right? So I hit control R, it stops the recording. Now, here's the other nice, nice thing is I could just say, ah, you know what? That was a bad take. I want to discard this. Or mm -hmm. I can say, no, let's keep it. So I hit save recording, right? Yeah. So it saves that to my videos director here. So if I go into my videos folder and I go to uh, terminal test.mkv, open that bad mamma jamma. There you can see it's playing back. And then I hit top here in a second and pow, there's my top screen. And see how clean that is? It's just awesome. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's 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 uh it's crisp because it's the just the actual grab of the screen. What's cool about it is you could also do this record open GL. Oh, and then yeah. you give it the program you want it to execute, it'll go launch that program and then capture. So this would be a great way to record yeah. a let's play. And since it also records your microphone. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to give you a tip on that. Um, a lot of folks are gonna be like, well, I can't get my microphone to work. Um, watch any of my old pulse audio videos, yeah. they'll help you out with that. But essentially the long and short version of it. Play this, get the program running as if it's recording, then open up your uh, uh, yeah. PAVU control. And it's and, important know, to note that it goes by whatever the default yeah. mic is. So yeah. you, it doesn't let you select the mic. It's just whatever your default right. system mic is. But that doesn't always work. So you may have to, you may actually have to uh, get the thing running and then actually choose what to do. Because especially with USB headsets, it gets a little funky. So now, of course, this is available in the Arch user repository. You can Ish. just install it, and it'll pull down everything you need for Simple Screen Recorder. Yep. We got a note uh, from the author of Simple Screen Recorder, so I thought I'd read that real quick. Uh, he says, hi, Chris and Matt. I just watched Chris switches to Arch Day 2. I did a nice. week of Arch videos. Uh, I was very surprised to see Simple Screen Recorder. I'm the creator of that program, and I was planning to send you an email about it as soon as I got an Ubuntu PPA up. Awesome. Well, we didn't need a PPA. We did not. No, we did no, not. Sir. No, uh, sir. He says, anyway, the reason I'm contacting you is because I know that the cause of those glitches, now if you watch my video, I had some screen flashing issues. It's an issue with the proprietary NVIDIA drivers and is not unique to Simple Screen Recorder. I've seen it happen with FFmpeg. The solution is to go in there, and he told me the fix. However, that fix didn't fix it for me. Mm. But I think it's something unique to GNOME 3.8, because I think if you do it under KDE or when you just select a box, it's pro no problem. It might be, yeah, because I did it uh, both under an Intel uh, chipset yeah. as well as an ATI, I, and it worked okay. I wonder mm. if it's the... If it's the video acceleration of Gnome Shell, Might and because be. that is an OpenGL thing itself, and then you're recording the mm -hmm. things inside mm -hmm. that. I Could be. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, he says, I've added some code to Simple Screen Recorder to detect this problem and fix it automatically. I did get the update, by the way, uh, uh, Martin. I uh, got that update. So uh, you won't have to do anything. I hope that you still try my program. We will. We really were impressed yeah. with it. And he says, I really like Last, especially the Arch Challenge. I've been an Arch nice. user for a few months, and I'm still discovering new things like Pack AUR. Keep up the good work. Nice. Martin. Good stuff. Yeah, so uh, go check out Simple Screen Recorder. Like he mentioned, there's PPAs for it. Mm -hmm. There's there, It's everywhere. It's really it's really straightforward, and it's so nice to have the mic recording capability. Right. And Arch Users, uh, uh, Arch User Repository. Yeah, it's yeah, it's in. right in there, Matt. Right it's in built there. right in there. All right. Works good. I want to give a nice plug to our Linux Action Show subreddit before we head out. Just Ooh, go over yeah. to linuxactionshow.reddit.com, and you can find people. You know, this place was hopping this week. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. as a matter of fact, I want to I actually <laughs> There's want to, already a still Oh, we do, really? Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. You've already got it in there. <laughs> uh, Extreme us. That is too funny. Uh, there's, there's. Uh, I mean, we have like probably a dozen people to give shout outs to. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I have, but I have one specifically that was really uh, huge, huge, huge for me. And I, of course, can't remember the screen name, but I did put it in the show notes. You did. You want me to pull it up? Uh, yeah, because it starts with a K. It's, uh, yeah, it was like, like a K. There you go. Uh, Kenovatech. Kenovatech. Yeah. Uh, Kenovatech, thank you so very much for this. And I uh, just wanted to give you a shout out because you have literally made my switch to Arch like massively less painful it was awesome yeah. so thank yeah, you yeah there's been there's been some really helpful uh, folks um uh there's the uh there's the arch uh, uh the arch uh, guide that was created yeah. that uh, oh man that was, was good. it blue phoenix that did that um, i George? believe so and i bookmarked it because it was like this is fantastic oh, yeah, I, I bookmarked it too i should go find that because it was actually yeah. it was really great um it was, it was dynamite i mean that's must read material yeah. oh he called it the arch survival guide that's yeah what and it's it. so it's like stuff some of the stuff you kind of it's like well yeah that makes sense but some stuff is like oh i didn't think of it that way it was really Really quite cool. Blackout twenty four. That's right. Nice. Black, Blackout twenty four has been awesome in the uh, in the switch over to mm -hmm. uh, Arch. So we're going to cover all of that in the second yes. half of the show, Matt. But first, let's do the news.
Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. I love that saying because it is actually so very, very true. I have the uh, I have the note too here, Matt. It's running on the Ting service. Been uh, just phone months now. Absolutely love the idea of taking these new powerful portable computers and combining them with a service that's actually designed to service the users. No Here's a couple of great things about Ting if you're not familiar with them. No contracts, no early termination fees, truly and completely contract free. You upgrade your phone, you get a new phone, you don't have to reset to a two-year contract. And the thing, the thing about those contracts is you and I both know that's how they get you. That's where they're getting you. And Ting is changing up the whole dynamic here. And this is what's extremely impressive, too. Uh, who, who else does this? Ting will credit you on your unused service. If you use less than you thought you would, Ting drops you down to the level and hits you with a difference on your next bill. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's like, <laughs> right, right, right? And, you know, uh, so I've, I've, I've been thinking about the Galaxy S4, and I'm going to be honest, I think I'm leaning a little more towards the HTC One. Really? And I'm, I've been on the fence, and I know I don't really need one, but sure, I, I, sure. I, I'll tell you I'm a little secret. I want to get my wife to switch <laughs> to Android. I see where you're going with this, right? I'm envisioning like a whole series of photos. Right. Angelo switches to Android. Well, it would be it would, it'd be a great topic. Yeah, it really would. would. And, and there's a lot of people out there who are on iPhones that mm. want to switch to Android. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking now, just because I'm a very nice husband, I'll give her my Note too. Aww. Right here, you go, honey, Aww. and I'll go get myself an HTC One. Sure. And now I have managed to suppress this temptation um, for the better part of well, since the HTC One was announced. Okay. Okay. I think it was on Thursday or Friday I learned that Michael Dominic from the Coder Radio program has gotten an HTC Uh-oh. One. I, I'm not going to hold it out, man. I can't hold it Phone envy. And here's what's great is when I buy this, I own it. I own the device. It is my device. I'm not sucked into some sort of money-milking contract. Right. It's I'm, I'm making the decision to be part of the process. And I think this is really important. You've got no mysterious line items on your bill. And here is the part that I really love. And this comes in handy. So uh, I'm a father. I have a son who sure. loves to use... Portable devices. Uh, yeah. He doesn't understand why when we leave the house, all of a sudden he can't download the on-demand content in his games or whatever. Right. Yeah. To him, the internet should be absolutely ubiquitous. Well, thanks to Ting, in our household, the internet is absolutely ubiquitous because hotspot nice. and tethering come with every single plan. Go over to Ting, nice. go to last.ting.com, save $25 off your device, and free yourself from the constraints of the big boys. And you know those big boys just keep milking you. They're not doing it for you. And Ting's changing things up. Go over to last.ting.com and say thanks to them for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Love Ting. Love Ting. Taking ownership in your mobile experience. And I think know, that's what that's about. You know? And and the, the reason why I think I'm going to actually be able to potentially get Angela to switch over to Android is because she's been sort of watching me switch to Ting and She's looking at us going. She's looking at her bill now and going. This is just. This yeah. Is this is like what? What's wrong with this yeah. picture? Right. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. And she's a practical person, and you give yep. her you give her the data, and she looks at it, and she's she's thinking about making the switch. That's a, now that's an argument I could try with my wife because yeah. she she looks at the same thing. She's I mean, Angela's money. Like, hey, wait a yeah, minute. Angela's been an iOS user since like the iPhone three G. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So for her to make that leap is a pretty big one. Wow. Thanks, mm-hmm. Ting. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's talk about some really good news. The city of Munich has announced that the migration to a sustainable Linux desktop has been completed successfully. Dun, 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 dun. Here's a little bit of the details. The city is now using a unified desktop system. They call mm-hmm. it Limux. Limux. It's their own distribution mm-hmm. based on Ubuntu. And uh, they, they include a bunch of, obviously, all of the open source applications. Of course. On 14,000 of the total 15,000 desktops that they have spread over Whoa. 51 offices across the city. Wow. That's, <laughs> That's more than 2,000 of, of their intended goal. They 2,000 over what they were planning to do, wow. uh, using Limux on more than 80% of their desktops. Um, the city confirmed that they'll also be switching to LibreOffice. They have been using OpenOffice since 2006. That is really impressive on multitude of levels. I mean, yeah. not just the uh, the fact that they're sticking to it, but the the growth and the the size and the scale itself is impressive. Yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting to watch. I I remember. I think this. I mean. This is one of those things where uh, they 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 sort of set that trend where we're going to migrate them to Firefox and OpenOffice right. first, and since they began, the when they started the LibreOffice project wasn't around, Chromium no. wasn't around, uh, Game was still the instant messenger right. of the Linux desktop, right? I so remember Game. It's been a long yep. transition, but I'm very impressed that they've actually overshot, and uh, they're seeing a great savings from it, and uh, they say that it's going to save this save the city over 10 million euros so far. That's not bad, and hopefully they've uh, upgraded enough to where they're not still like rocking gnome meeting and stuff like that. So. <laughs> I'm just I'm just throwing out some age there. You know. Speaking of gnome, I'm a gnome switcher uh, as of recent. As part of this Arch challenge, mm-hmm. I also switched to gnome three eight. I don't know. You remember how, how when we were when we were covering the release of gnome three eight. Right. 
I was like, man, I'd really love to review this on the show. That's right, yeah. But there just wasn't a distribution out there that was taking the latest packages of GNOME and getting it right. Exactly. You oh. were looking for that perfect, because yeah. the distributions were doing it their way, not your way. And, and you know, like in most important. cases, like all of the current crops that shipped, shipped with GNOME 3.6. Right. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like, eh, why? Not a problem on Arch. No. Not and on Arch, problem. you don't care. You're, it's fresh. Just do it man. yourself, man. It's fresh. Right, right so, out of the oven. So uh, now that I got GNOME 3.8 all set up perfectly... Uh oh, we have a little streamage problem here. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, 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 jeez, guys, what's going on? Oh boy, on? oh boy, it's there back. it is. It's back. It's back. Okay, are you good, Matt? I'm good. Okay. I'm, I'm still here. I figured now that I got GNOME 3.8, let's uh, mess it all up by uh, switching to GNOME 3.10. I why not? Yep. So uh, <laughs> the uh, GNOME team is working on GNOME 3.10, and uh, yeah. here's what it looks like. It, okay. This is the this is the development branch version. They've got. Uh, tell me what you think of this, Matt. No music. No a new app for music. playing music. It's not yet complete or feature hmm. complete, uh, so it doesn't really compete with, say, Rhythmbox. Sure. But it looks refreshing, and it already is playing music. Well, and, and tight integration is something to be... There's something to be said for that. So if they're able to provide the basic functionality that you're wanting and provide that tight integration, then I can definitely see that being pretty beneficial. Yeah, pretty cool. uh, I don't know. I mean, I like... You're right. I do agree there's not, like, good integration yet with a music player. Yeah. Um and so, I mean, I'm, I'm I do I do like that. I won't I won't say I'm skeptical, but I will say that I'm I'm excited to see where they go with it. But in the meantime, I'm okay with where I'm at. I don't quite get, and I, I know it's not like an organization where they identify the list of their priorities and then sure. they say, okay, you know, subdivision of this department, you're going to mm -hmm, work on this. Mm -hmm. A music app, though, it's kind of like the one thing <laughs> Linux desktop doesn't really need any more right. of. Well, and, and here's, like, here's almost my, every other right. category we, we have holes, but the music app category we've got like a metric. Well, S I think ton the of apps. problem is that you know, okay, Rhythm Box sucks. I'm sorry, but it just does. Oh, um, I like. Rhythm I don't Box. like Rhythm Box. Actually, I like Banshee. Banshee, while I know it's oh my god, it's mono, but you know, besides the fact you're afraid you're going to catch mono with it, I, you know, the point of it is is that it, it works. It's fine. I mean, I, they're probably better off going that direction, but you know, they want to do this. That's fine as long as it doesn't affect other stuff. Whatever. That's what I worry about. But yeah, all right, yeah. let's talk about. Gnome Maps. Ooh, now this is cool. This is uh, this is looking nice, especially uh, I don't know what data it uses. Mm -hmm. I love I love the uh, open open street maps or what's that? Mm -hmm. is that what I that? believe it's open street maps. There's a there's we'll an app I have that integrates it in there and they're actually really good because uh, they almost take like a wiki approach where community members that also have the app will mark stuff on the map as like, oh, you know, this needs to be fixed or whatever. Sure. So if they're pulling from that, I think this could be actually really compelling in the desktop because open street maps isn't I don't think represented enough no, in a desktop it's really application. Not. But again, I also go back to like, is this what they're spending their time on? Yeah, I, you know, I'm okay with it. Here, here's how I envision them doing it. If they want to kind of make this their release for all the frou-frou stuff like this, and that's fine. That's cool. But making sure that they don't continue to do that with every release and they're not forgetting those important core components. That well, we the care problem about, I have you know? with any of this stuff is so. once you make it, it never goes away. It's a noose around your neck. Oh, that's true. That's right? true. Because you have to take ownership of it. Yeah, you have, from always that have to point maintain on. it. You have to patch mm -hmm. it. You have to add new features. I, yeah, yeah. Unless they've got special, unless they've got set, teams set aside where it's not pulling from their mainstream team. I don't know. I'd have see, to see how it's to be. I, I go back to, mm. I go back to, I think they're still developing it for touch. And they're like, yeah. well, every every mobile application needs a map app. Oh, God. Every no. mobile device needs a map app. No, no. Come on, guys. It's, and, uh, it, you're allowed to have a desktop situation that is not designed for touch. It's allowed. You can do that. It's okay. But I'm, I'm, remaining to, I, I'm willing to remain open to this just to see you I'll know play with it, it could be cool like yeah, if it could whatever. like if, honestly if i could let's talk like let's talk like after after 1.0 or, or whatever it is is released yeah. maybe this thing could integrate traffic alerts into my gnome so in my gnome uh, in my gnome notification bar could come up and say the traffic in your area is you know you know you want to impress me and in, integrate ways into that somehow figure out a way to yeah. api them in something yeah. i don't care but i mean get that's i'm already i'm already apt the pappy there. Why would I go do something else? I don't know. All right, let's blast through yeah. these last few features here. Um, <laughs> I, I, this one actually seems like a useful app. Ooh, a, a, Git, yeah. a Git client built into the GNOME desktop mm -hmm. that lets you manage your uh, your Git account. Mm -hmm, I actually mm -hmm. think that's probably pretty handy I'm for a lot of folks. I'm liking that. Good yeah. stuff. Uh, there's also a new uh, notes application. It's called... Oh, it's called One Open. Mm -hmm. Look, B I J J B E N. Well, I mean, it's so easy to remember. How could you not? It's like, you know, what define irony, right? They you're, couldn't you're, just call it notes or something, right? I mean, it's like defining irony with. Uh, we're going to have something to help you remember that you can't remember the name of. I mean, really? Uh, but uh, it's a it's a name. feature complete, and it's going to it's near feature complete, right. and it will support data exchange with Tomboy, mm. oh, and eventually cool. online account syncing is planned. Okay, I mean, it looks cool. I mean, I'm, I'm not knocking it. It's just the name, the naming scheme is. You know, you got to remember those of us in the U.S. We're not going to remember what the hell it's called. 
I'm sorry. It's not gonna happen. Totem gets a new UI, which looks quite Very good. Very cool. Yeah. And there Liking you go, that. Matt. And uh additional shell improvements with um you know, nice little tweaks. Gnome 3 is really cleaning up nicely. I'm liking uh, liking where they're going to stuff. Yeah. I, I'm very, very, very happy with Gnome mm. 3. I worry that uh, my extensions will break. Yeah. Well, that's always kind of a thing, no matter what you're doing. I've had that happen in KDE, XFC. It happens, you know. Just... All right, Matt. Yeah. Next story. Got a lot of people upset, a lot of people excited. Prompted <laughs> yeah. John C. Dvorak to do an ultimate troll of the Linux community. Uh, of course. Mark Shuttleworth has marked Ubuntu's number one bug as fixed. Mm. And that bug was... Microsoft has a majority market share. Yeah, yeah, he did mark it as fixed, although I believe he marked it as fixed with something that's not his product. <laughs> the bug was open back in 2004, a month before the first release of Ubuntu was made. Mm-hmm. Concerned Microsoft was in the dominant market position. The desired fix for the bug was listed as the majority of PCs for sale should include only free software. Okay. I would not say we have reached that goal. I, yeah, I, I think he's been a little over-optimistic because Android is kind of a debatable situation. So. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth uh, reasons a personal computing today is a broader proposition than it was in 2004. Mm-hmm. Phones, mm-hmm. tablets, wearables, True. True. and other devices are all part of the mix for our digital lives. From a competitive perspective, that broader market has healthy competition with iOS and Android representing a meaningful share. Mm-hmm. Android may not be... Uh, may not be my or your first choice of Linux, but right. it is without a doubt an open source platform that offers both practical and economic benefits to users and industry. I'll so we that. have both competition and good representation for open source and personal computing. Mm-hmm. Even though we've yeah. only played a small part in that shift, I think it's important for us to recognize that the shift has taken place. So Ubuntu's perspective, this bug is now closed. I would have said triaged, but that's cool. I'll go with closed. Yeah, or um, a workaround has been applied. Or, there we go. Yeah, 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 here's your here's your bash. I don't think for, uh, I don't actually don't think you can mark a bug as a workaround, <laughs> but um, in in the launch pad, eh. uh, I, this sat. Um, what this what this sat with me as is now. I just look at this from the very very beginning of Ubuntu. This to me sort of felt like Canonical saying. Yeah, we're kind of done fighting for the desktop. We don't really think that's going to work out. The desktop right. to Canonical now to me seems like you, you you demote it to right along next to the phone and the mm-hmm. tablet, and it's just part of a client operating system that needs to integrate with the same services that these mobile devices do. I would say so. I would say so. I mean, what, what, uh, one thing I would give them props on is we haven't achieved a point yet to where I feel like they've, they've uh, labeled it as third-class citizen, but I do feel like it's slowly kind of trickling down to second-class citizen. I do feel like it's kind of – its importance oh, yeah. on the desktop oh, is, yeah. is oozing that way. Thankfully, functionality hasn't been affected yet, but we don't know. I mean, that could, in fact, happen. Yeah, we could we, – you know, starting with the next couple of releases of yeah. Ubuntu, we may or may not see that. I guess – so I feel like – I feel like I don't I, – I don't want them to give up the fight. Right. And, and they're like, eh, you know, this just isn't – this just isn't our battle. This is not going to be something we're going to win, and – but they could have. I mean, that was that's the whole thing of it is they quit using their users like crash test dummies and, you know, and actually just really get out there. Uh, you know, I mean, part of here's one of my biggest gripes, single hands down biggest gripe I have with the, with Ubuntu, especially the way they do things on their page, is when you look at their partners and all that, do they list any of the smaller partners that have stuck with Ubuntu? Uh, ZA Reason, System76, any of those guys, any of the other various vendors. People who've pioneered right. deployment on a, no, on a OEM system. No, they don't. No, who are they promoting? Oh, we're going to promote us some Dell because they're a big brand name right. and, they support, and they support us off and on right. throughout, you know, come on. Right. They support right. us on a whim. Yeah. And watch watch as Canonical starts going through, as Ubuntu starts going through these growth pains where yeah. the desktop isn't as good as it needs to be. It isn't up to snuff. What do you suppose these guys are going to do? Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Nadell's going to flip flop again. Now, yeah. and I'm not speaking about the enterprise stuff. I'm talking about like j- just the home user stuff. Yeah. You know, where you can just go and buy a Dell, whatever it is, Sputnik um, or whatever. You know. They. they I, okay. So John C. Dvorak yeah. uh, tackled this issue oh, probably yeah. in a way that you probably want to wear some flame retardant pants when you read this. But oh, uh, oh, yeah. He said so. He, uh, uh, Dvorak opens up his piece over on uh, PCMeg.com. Mark Shuttleworth, the founder of Canonical, publish, publishers of Ubuntu, has given up on the idea that Linux. Will ever supplant Windows, saying that if any OS will be the next big thing, it's Apple's iOS or Google's Android. I, I agree. That's essentially what Mark Dvorak said. is correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that that, that, that opening that paragraph, part is right. Yeah. That opening paragraph pissed off so many people in our subreddit alone that even though I'm the one that submitted the link to the subreddit, they wanted it pulled from the Reddit. 
They oh. wanted it pulled from the Reddit because it was so upsetting. I was like, wow, okay. Yeah, there's psychology there. Uh, so here's some of these. Uh, here's one of the more trolly pieces. I don't believe that anyone in the Linux community has ever spent a dime selling the idea, or any idea for that matter. This is probably the worst example of the ridiculous concept that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. And what he's saying there, I think, is yeah. uh, Linux distributions went on the merits of, well, it's a better system. It's right. more secure. It has these X, Y, and Z problems solved. And I think history shows out that has never been enough reason to get consumers to switch. Yep, it, it's 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 a great example. There was a, back, oh, like I want to say like the twenties or something. There was a competitor to Zippo, and they made a better lighter. Yeah, and and you may have heard of this, and it was so good that you never really needed to you know to spend money on components or find replacements or whatever, and it wasn't very attractive to sell. That's kind of what I think has happened with Linux on the desktop. Is it is so effective. And it can be crafted and customized to fit the need of the end user that it's really kind of mi minimal on the upsells and the extra stuff that they're used to in a proprietary yeah. software space. Well, and That's kind of my view of it. It's kind of – it kind of seems to me now more a little more obvious that the Linux desktop always needed a really good OEM to take it up and package yeah. it. I mean – you, I, like, you need a big national brand to say, look. Well, you look at like, yeah, cap. you look at you look at these you look at these packaged up solutions, and then you have essentially a turnkey Linux right. development, and it's their responsibility to market. He goes on to say, now he's putting instead of putting it on the OEMs, he puts it on the open source community. He says, as a whole, the open source community doesn't believe in the idea that sales and marketing is actually important. All that ever, all that ever passed for marketing with that bunch was the gimmicky but cute tux the Linux penguin. Most important, Linux could never shed the early image of being a DOS-like operating system with a command line structure. He's right and wrong. Um, first of all, everything Dvorak does, he does as a science, and there's a reason why he trolls you, so understand that as you read that. But his point being that we basically are taking more of a, a geeky approach. And I would say that it has begun to change, but there are components and factors that do tend to drop us down. I don't know. I down. think, I think, um, I think not you're not giving them enough thing. credit. I think Dvorak recognizes that that's not the case. Because see, in this next line mm -hmm. here, he says, a variety of cool GUI interfaces were long available for the last decade, exemplified by Ubuntu. And then he says, sure. I hardly ever used any command line routines on my Linux box. Yeah, Dvorak. So, But what he's saying, though, is... Linux could never shed the image of being old and DOS-like. Not okay. that it is, but he says the image of it. And I do agree with that. I think a lot of people out there yeah. still think Linux means command line, and some people are totally cool with that, kind of like Well, myself. but I, I think that you're looking at two different markets of people. And first of all, John, if you're watching this, you and I both know you don't run Linux on anything other than a VM, so I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> oh! I, I know this for a fact. But anyway, um, that being said, uh, <laughs> just putting that out there. So the, as far as the two groups and the two communities, there are two communities. You have people that have are Windows Power users that have experienced Linux. They have various opinions of it. Then you have people that don't even know what the hell a Linux is. They think it's a penguin. I mean, they, they literally Really don't even know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that penguin They don't thing. have an opinion, and much like as we saw with the adoption of Android, get it out there, advertise it, put it out there in a compartmentalized, easy-to-use you know, situation, whatever the distro may be, Mint, Ubuntu, whatever, um, OpenSUSE, whatever it may be, and people will get to it, but you actually have to get it in front of them. I've said it for years. Yeah. You've got to get on kiosks. If you can't do it yeah. through storefronts, kiosks. you gotta you got to wrap it up and you know, get it in front of them. Get it in malls. Yeah. I've, I've run a booth, a booth at the mall many years ago. Yes, you can get stuff in front of people, and it does work. You know, I think, I think people got so upset by some of the language he used and some of the accusations that a part of the message that I, I believe – he has put into words what upsets me about Mark closing that bug. Yeah. And here's what he says. I want my processor power to be locally, preferably right in front of me. Sure. People were trying to get away from central control for decades when the first personal computers appeared in 1975. There were wimp, they were WIMP machines by today's standards, and off-board storage was a cassette deck. Now we have incredible processing power, and you get a high-speed 4-terabyte hard disk for $180 at Costco. Mm -hmm. Yet people are returning to the big mama in the sky accepting a client-server relationship that was a consistent flop decades ago. That is until the internet began to dumb down the majority of users. With Linux never catching on and the rise of cloud-centric operating systems alongside the weak phone, tablet OS, taking over, everyone is back where they started pre-1975. Centralized control wins out. I guess that is what the public wanted all along. And the personal computer movement was actually a fad. Who knew? 
Um, I would agree with him in the sense that I would say the internet and, and basically market-driven stuff, pay, people are going to uh, go for what's easy. They're going to go for what's comfortable, what's mm -hmm. familiar. Uh, those are certainly factors. They're and so, busy. They don't want to have right. to hassle. Le you know, not just legacy software, but legacy experiences, legacy uh, perceptions. Um, you know, it, it's a little bit like if you've driven I, a stick all your life actually, and you're asked to drive an automatic. I think the, the butt, flop you know. in a lot of ways of, of these mobile devices that have windows on them yeah. is a sign that people associate sort of legacy baggage with the Windows brand, and they're avo avoiding those devices because of that. So Absolutely. I think that backs up what you're saying. What Here's my concern is, is so uh, as a system administrator early on in my career, I moved people away from a mainframe setup mm -hmm. to a DOS setup, right. and then from that DOS setup to a Windows terminal server setup, where sure. we sort of we went from we went from a mainframe setup to essentially what was a mainframe setup with dumb machines in the past. And there right. are consistent and systematic downsides to that setup. And I think John C. Dvorak is right. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is if we don't have a predominantly strong Linux desktop vendor, even if it's Ubuntu, if mm -hmm. it's OpenSys, whoever it is, but if somebody that the OEMs are embracing, which as of right now appears to be Ubuntu, all widespread. Sure. If we don't have that, then the two winners of the desktop battle, Apple and Microsoft, both of them resell cloud computing services. Absolutely. Both of them resell mobile devices. Mm -hmm. Both of them are highly incentivized to move people in this direction. And I don't want this. No, I don't and they're this. and they're also in brick and mortar, which we as geeks like to pretend like doesn't exist. We love we love ourselves from Amazon, but let's face it, you know, they still and, people still shop at And them. listen to listen to this comment. Listen, li some of these people in here. Uh, oh, of course, now it's way down here. But right. like people in here are like, uh, John, I don't think I don't think you're uh, acknowledging the benefit of the cloud. And like, w what does that even mean? Yeah. And what no, is the yeah, benefit of yeah. the cloud that I can sync my files? I don't really need the cloud for that. Right. I, well, I, and I overheard a lady at Best Buy once say, "Can I get this with cloud?" I swear to God, she said that. That's the mentality of people you're working with. It's not that they're stupid. It's just this is what they know. They they've never been versed I in this. I think I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. Seriously, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Well, that's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move to some people that know. I mean, it, it's it's I so I while I found John's article to be trolly, and when he talks about the open source community and Linux, he's generalizing like a bat out of hell. Yeah. But I do agree with some of his core points, and I realize it's hard to read that article because you got to sift through all of the cruft to get to the nugget. Sure. But I think he's kind of right. right. One and that's thing, what bugs me about one marking that bug close. Right, and I agree with that. But one closing thought I want to cover that the chat room keeps saying they're stupid. No, 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 no. That It's like saying I'm stupid because I don't take responsibility for the food I put in my body. I'm going to take the easy way out, go have a fast food, whatever it is, because I'm lazy. Not because I'm stupid. I know better. I, I understand that I could potentially gain a benefit, but I'm lazy. There's a difference between lazy and stupid, although they do tend to overrun each other once in a while. So laziness is why people won't change legacy habits unless there's disruptive change, like me coming into their life, mm. like I've done for people, mm -hmm. changed up their lives, and oh my gosh, this is great, I love it. But they don't have that disruptive force. That is what happens. It's our decision, our responsibility to get out there and make it happen. It's not going to happen by itself. Let's talk about one of those disruptive forces. Yes. Uh, the uh, Australian government is disrupting the Microsoft Office monopoly. Oh they have picked ODF as their standard doc format. Wow. The Australian government, uh, and specifically mm -hmm. the Information Management Office, which is AGIMO for short, catchy, right, right, right. has been examining uh, Office file formats for only as long as a government bureaucracy could, <laughs> years <laughs> Several years, as a matter that, of fact. Right, right, right. As part of the terms of the Common Operating Environment Policy, which also sounds like a bureaucratic nonsensical document, sure. a document which contains a number of guidelines restricting how departments mm. and agencies should allow access across their desktops. In January of 2011, AGIMO had initially decided to standardize department agencies on Microsoft's Office Open XML format. Mm. And uh, however, this move was greeted by a sea of criticism directed at the agency by online commenters, right. love it, trolls, right, right. and consistently AGMI, and consequently AGIMO decided to re-examine the choice. Sure. After uh, so looking at it in 2012, they have announced ODF will be the preferred and supported format, consistent right with on. the aims to ensure that common standards and practical open standards are used. Well, I think anytime you're dealing with uh, dealing with the public, I think it's important to uh, to kind of go with that view and not lock yourselves into something that's uh, you know nasty. A little little golf clap for the uh, Australian government for switching over. Yeah, here. absolutely. Yeah, good job, guys. Good job. That Big thumbs up for that. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, props for definitely props. Everybody needs to uh, kind of think about that because you know, these documents you need the, a lot of people want them 10, 15 years. Some right. of these documents you got to wonder what formats are going to be you know 
readable mm-hmm. in that time. It's that is it that is a several generations in computer technology. It is. Yeah. It but is. open standards stand the test of time, Matt. At, it stands the test of time and just put it puts you in the driver's seat, really. I know? feel like talking about Arch. I want to talk about some Arch. All right, well uh, that that'll wrap up the news for this week. We have links to everything we just covered in the show notes, but with that all done, let's go jump in to our week with Arch. week we really stepped in it when we said some nasty things about arch that were completely inaccurate so we decided this week we would take the arch challenge we did we lived in arch for a week we've been living literally living in arch yeah for a week and we're going to tell you about some of our findings some good some bad and Mm -hmm. things like that before we start Mm -hmm. i want to thank our segment sponsor system 76 creators of machines born to run linux You know, I was thinking we were talking earlier about switching people over to Linux right. and, and making that nice smooth transition. Sable Complete, I think, would be the perfect machine for a new switcher. My wife, a Mac user, has been eyeballing that stuff. Oh yeah, she's been like, honestly, got, she's like, hey. it's got that high design to it. You yeah, know what I'm she's saying? Really like, she loves it. She thinks it's gorgeous. Plus, remember we had that audience member who mounted it. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. Now yep. I just noticed that my Bonobo Extreme here is on sale right now. So oh, if you've yeah. been thinking about getting a Bonobo Extreme, now might be the time because I noticed they have they have a special offer on the they Bonobo. Do. This machine is a monster. It is. I, uh, on the pre-show, was playing this insanely high graphics uh, game with mirrored video, absolutely no problem. And then this last week, it's been an absolute champ. I think, I think, and I'm not, this is totally not part of the ad. I would yeah. just say straight front, I don't think my transition to Arch would have been so smooth if I didn't have such a Linux-friendly laptop. I believe it. Out and, of the yeah. box, on Arch, Wi-Fi is working, no problem. Power management's right. working, my sleep's working, my video worked with the uh, open yeah, source Yeah, well, to driver. give you an example, I have another laptop. I tried it on uh, backlighting problems. Him? No. There's yeah. no backlighting problems. Yeah. Me? Yes. Yeah. That just points it right out there. Yeah, just saying. So uh, go over to System76, go get a machine designed to run yep. Linux, get a good experience, and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Yeesh. We love when you guys Good do stuff. That. Love those guys. I want to start with the installation on yes. Arch. Yes. Now, uh, this is probably the thing that I had the most angst about, but, you know, I've done it before. Right, right. It, and, I've done, and I've done older, like, way back in the day, like, years ago, uh, some distributions like that. And it was never something I, I en- at the time, I enjoyed. I really didn't. So what'd you think? What'd you think now, about Now, honestly, it was kind of like, the first time it was kind of like, uh, you know, I was kind of like, okay, this is a lot of work. Then I discovered Archboot, tried it that way. Then the third time I did it, I went back to the old school way, and oh, yeah? suddenly... Because I used Archboot to do some of the stuff for me, when I looked at the wiki, it looked like a whole different page. Because I was like, oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, oh I know Very that interesting. So what was interesting is because it wasn't, again, me not being stupid, it was I'm a muscle memory person because of various – I have a couple of learning disabilities when it comes to uh, reading stuff. And so by attributing it to muscle memory through – and identification through Archboot, when I went back to install it manually using the wiki – it was I was able to identify needed information quicker and faster and easier in nice little bite sized pieces. Yeah. Just like that. I mean it was really nice. So arch boot it your first time to kind of get used to the process, then go a second time old school and you'll thank me later. So that's my recommendation. There's there's a downside to the arch uh uh, installation process is that sure. it does appear to be intimidating to begin with. Once you go it through it once or twice, it's actually it's not that bad. And no, it really isn't. Consequently, it does give you a little better insight on how your Linux box is actually built. Right. And, and so then later on, when oh, you're you doing some troubleshooting, and when you break something later on, it's awesome because you went through that process, you know how to fix it. I mean, yeah. it like really helps. I'll yeah, no, that. that is very true. Um, and you 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 find that you end up after installation with a box that has just. The bare essentials. Like <laughs> I was in GNOME, I didn't even have an image viewer. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I had like I have like I have to constantly install little dependencies here and there to make right. things work. But I almost see this is so if that sounds good to you, if starting with a slim machine and then sort of building on as you go is yeah. is sounds like the, the approach you would mm-hmm. want to take. I think that's sort of one of the core things as an arch user that will kind of give you success. Is if you mm-hmm. if you like mm-hmm. that philosophy of keeping it very simple, keeping it very minimal, and then building on top of that. If yep. you would prefer to say sit down in a machine, and you know by default they've picked an image viewer for you, by default right. they've picked a web browser for you, and all of this stuff, and then you can obviously change it. You can obviously change mm-hmm. it. But if you would prefer to start with a set of all of the stuff done for you, then another distribution might be a better approach for you. I think you can boil it down like that. I would even go so far as to say uh, Arch versus other distributions is a little bit like uh, OEM PCs with all the extra Windows cruftware yeah. versus a machine you built yourself. Yeah. That is literally how I would compare it to because yeah. even though those apps may or may not be 
bad, they may not be something you want. You may not want Norton antivirus on your Windows machine, therefore you build your own. Same thing with Arch. You may not want uh, GIMP or whatever it is. You may not want these other things installed. And it gives you a nice setup. And, yeah. and what's cool is because with the Arch install itself, it's really two components. I mean, the first part of the Arch install is basically going to get you to a command prompt. You can log yeah. in. You can, And that's awesome because yeah. that allows you to literally craft it the way you want. And now, see, here's my – this is my GNOME 3.8 desktop, which I've showed off. I yeah. did a, a series of daily Arch videos that we'll have a link in the show notes. And mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. we have uh, – we have Great. And we have some good stuff. Five days worth there. And then yep. Matt came in on day six and did a, yep. did a Switch video. So if you're curious – how all of the context of our switch journey, the things yeah. we ran into, the bumps along the road, we tried to document a lot of it there. That's Absolutely. linked. You can go watch all of those. So it's about an hour's worth when it's all there put is. together. But, uh, you know, it's one hour and five minutes, actually, which is funny because they were just released in, in, in micro chunks. Well, it was also interesting, the uh, built for Linux machine versus a non-built for Linux machine that we that we tested it on and uh, the differences there. But, you know, the fact that Arch made it doable. It yeah. really did. So. Also, one thing that made it doable is the community. Oh, God, yes. Oh, huge. huge. Um, now, day one and two of my Switch, yeah. uh, I was, I, I had I'd hit yeah. some bad community uh, locations, I guess. Yeah, yeah experiences. Yeah, right. uh, people were um, sort of a little elitist, and um, like I would ask a question, and I would sort of get attacked for like, well, what are you doing doing that? Like, right. you know, uh, using your word, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, what mm-hmm. are you thinking using your word? You could break your system doing that. Well, okay, this is just what I found. Right. The, the, I, the, what, my experience with the Linux or with the Arch community specifically, when I first started interacting with them, I we got off on the wrong foot, um, as as they discovered. Um, you know, a, a poke bear and you'll get you know clawed. Yeah. But that being said, I forged stronger relationships with those people because of that, because they were so passionate and I was mm. so hard headed. We forged bonds that allowed me to get the installation well, set up the way I want. You pitched an idea during so. our week in, you know, you said, hey, by the way, OMG yeah, yeah. Arch is available. Right. And you were kind of half kidding when you said that. I was half kidding, but I was, but, but people picked up on it. And I've been saying that, yeah. you know. I, I think part of the problem is, is there is a whole newbie area to Arch. There's mm-hmm. newbie IRCs. There's newbie forms. The right. wiki is incredible. And there's like everything on the wiki. There's even a wiki entry for System76 machines yeah. on the wiki. Mm. Uh, the problem is, as a new user who's completely unfamiliar with this whole community and this whole world, I don't even know to go to those places. Right. I mean, the only place you're going to you're going to you're going to basically you'll know to go to the beginning section, I suppose. Yeah. But outside of that, you're, there yeah. may be tips and tricks and even experiences that I think that a separate site and actually someone did uh, one of our community members, members bought the domain and we're actually getting ready to right. Build it, so, so if there so this is one of the huge cool. advantages that Ubuntu has is there's this massive community yeah. that's constantly talking about new and great applications coming to Ubuntu that is constantly yeah. giving people channels that they can sort of line up into and then and then find a path to getting Ubuntu deployed. There's right. there's not really a lot like that for Arch. You kind of you kind of already have to know about Fight Club in order to get into Fight Club. Right, right. Well, and a good example of because a lot of people said, "Well, duh, that's stupid. What kind of content would you put on there?" Well, I might say, let's say in your Arch news, there's like, "Hey, here's an update for this. Some things you need to be aware of." It's nice to then take that, put it on a separate site, and actually build a story around it. Maybe someone's user experience with it. Uh, yeah. They they didn't see the news story in time, screwed something up, how they recovered. Things like that, I think, are really fun and interesting. I to read. I also think yeah. I mean, you look at what some of these blogs do, and it's just like yeah. we're just talking about stuff the way Arch users would use it. You know, right. here's a new app and it's really cool we just reviewed yeah. it by the way it's in the repository super nathan wrote a blog and he linked it in our subreddit yeah. he uh, i think we might have had a couple hundred people taking the arch challenge I mean, yeah I this was I, I had a lot of people emailing me yeah. about it it was cool so super nathan wrote uh with his about his experiences with the arch community he says yeah. first things first i need to talk about the arch community mm-hmm. seriously guys get off your high horse I'm no Linux new, but I hate being told to RTFM. Sure, occasionally I ask a dumbass question, but some of the time I'm asking a legit question, and I would love to have some assistance. Also, I know you're proud of being able to install and configure Arch, but it isn't rocket science. Uh, I, I guess what he's addressing is sort of, there is this bar that is right. the entry for Arch, and you have to be able to be this tall to get onto True. Arch. No, I would agree with that. And some people, I think, who can ride the arch ride kind of wear it as a badge of honor and sort of demean people who haven't yet gotten tall enough to reach that bar. Not everybody. Not even maybe the majority. Right. But th- there's people out there. And I think this goes back to yeah. there's not a lot of... There's not a lot of like obvious ways for beginners to really dig in unless you already know those places to go. Despite, and I would go so far as to say despite the, uh, the beginner section of the wiki, which is awesome and it's really, really helpful, um, I would say... 
if you've not broken another Linux distribution and found, a, like, let's say you broke X and you don't know how to recover from that, you're not ready for Arch. Let me put it that way. That's probably the simplest way to put it. Is and that's why you're going to the able, actual yeah. installation is good. You need to learn that process. And, and go, now you can switch to Arch and learn it from Arch. That's fine. But I think that if you don't know how to do those things, you are going to have a harder time than someone that's yeah. used to fixing what they broke. That's you gotta, you got to check you know? the wiki. That's one thing right. you really got to learn to do. The documentation um, is there. You mm -hmm. just need to, you really need to spend some time learning to use your search function. You just I, need, you know. I, I don't mean to like, you know, because there's also, there's, with any yeah. with any passionate community where you have passionate kind of trolls, sure. you also have the passionate evangelists who really help out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Arch is more powered by the community than really any other distro. I mean, between the wiki documentation, the forums, the IRC, and then, of course, the Arch user repository. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it is a whole level of community interaction that I think maybe only Gentoo can match. I would agree. I, it was my experience that it was refreshing when you hook up with, uh, with the Arch users that are really helpful, and there are some of them that are awesome. They seem to be more receptive and more... Uh, I don't know, more accurate in their responses than, like, say, Ubuntu. Yeah. If you go to the Ubuntu yeah. forums, good freaking luck. Well, you, you have a lot the... more experts in the Arch yeah. area. I mean, the, it shows. And it the really other thing shows. you have is you have a sense of community participation right. that, that I think is at a level where you're not going to have one company who is just going to have some wild, harebrained idea to bust into some, some new market and take the whole distribution off on this crazy-ass track that you're not That's so sure true. you want to go down. You're not being coursed into a desktop environment. You're not being coursed into right. uh, a certain way of doing things. Arch, but, yeah. Arch is like a platform which you build your own Linux on top of. I sure. really feel like my installation here is... Is my installation. Yeah. I'm using... That's uh, the cool part. That's I'm using really cool my part. apps that I want. I have yeah. my defaults. I'm using... I picked my I picked my sound subsystem. Yeah. I picked my font rendering subsystem. You chose whether or not you want Pulse installed. You decided... All that. of this yeah. stuff. Right. I, you know, Pigeon is my default yep. instant messenger. Chromium right. is my default web browser. Yep. All of this stuff is complete. And and this takes me to my next point. You okay. Is I feel like I've potentially built the best Linux experience I've ever had. Yeah, I, that's that's been my experience. I mean, once I got you know, the, once I got passed and got it set up the way I wanted, and like, once oh, I, this once is my nice. wrap my head around uh, the Pac-Man system yeah. and the Arch user repository, right. now I'm in heaven. Right now, got now it. I'm on the gravy train of all the apps I want. I just got to be careful. And that's this right. is what I'm worried about. I'm worried about losing my precious. I'm worried about yeah. because I am relying heavily on extensions in GNOME. I mean, like sure. everything right now has basically been modified via extensions. And because I'm using a distribution that has a very high velocity for packages, I'm worried about future updates borking my precious. I'm, you, I'm worried well, about that. There's two things. And I and I, the first one I think is called, it's something strap, arch strap or something strap. I forget exactly what it is. But basically, if I understand it correctly, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a script that will basically get you set. Well, you know, it's got everything the way you like it. You can set your system back up in a flash. No mm. big deal. Yeah. The easier, most obvious way of doing it is Clonezilla. Um, you yeah. know, that, that's how I'm doing it now because it's like, this is awesome. But, and I've experienced the install process, but I literally have like an hour of free time a day. So it's like, I don't necessarily, I'd rather spend that hour, you know, tweaking the system with all the cool stuff I can do versus yeah. the installation process. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I just clone Zilla and call it good. You know? So I'm going to look into, I have yeah. I didn't get, I wanted to, I wanted to have a chance to try this before the show, but right, I just didn't right. have time because I was doing some other things. All right. um, but there's this, there, I'm using oh, ButterFS yeah. on my root and on my home, uh, this install. It's cool, man, because I got ButterFS, mm -hmm. I have the SSD optimizations turned on, Ooh, all of that stuff yeah. I could do, right? Right. Right, right. And not that you couldn't do it in Ubuntu, but you couldn't. But I, yeah. I never get around to doing it. But because I had to do it while sure. I was setting it up, I set it right. Snapper is a command line program for file system snapshot management, mm -hmm. and it supports ButterFS, Extended 4, all that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. And you can take pre and post snapshots. So you can do something like, all right, well, I'm about to do an Arch uh, upgrade and up upgrade all my AUR packages. Right. Snapshot my file system. Mm -hmm. I install it. I reboot. Maybe GNOME doesn't load properly. Or maybe oh, all okay. of my extensions break. Sure. I go back into Snapper, and I just say restore to my previous snapshot point, hit that, and it restores the file system back to the state it was before I ran Snapper. And that's a handy approach if you're, I mean, a lot of people are wired to where they're like, well, I could do that or I could just go ahead and roll the packages back, which is awesome. Yeah, but yeah. not everybody is, if you're if you're kind of in a crunch time most right. days, being able to just flash the you whole know, thing back is a nice option. I had too, a little you know? brief moment of, of anxiety yeah. this morning because uh, I decided to just... I wanted to say, you know, I've done all the updates. Mm -hmm. I've been updating daily since I did this. Right. So I did one more update this morning. And I thought, what if I sit down now? And Because one of them was an NVIDIA, the NVIDIA oh, drive. Yeah, and right. I thought, what if I sit down and I plug in the HDMI cable and I no longer can get video out from my laptop to the sure. production machine? That's a thing. And I sit down at 10 a.m., we go live, and I need to have video out of my laptop. So I need reliability mm -hmm. there because 
there's a deadline involved. Right. So that's where the snapshot management, I think, for me, sort Absolutely. of alleviates some of that concern. I think technology's gotten to the point where I can live on this cutting edge, rolling distribution, but sort of take safety precautions, either through like, you know, a Clonezilla, Clonezilla sure. or or Snapper. So that's, that's my great. that's my intention. And so because of that, my intention is to remain on Arch. Yeah. I mean, because truly at that point, you know, you 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 suddenly it's not it's no longer a, a nail biting experience of did I track my packages? Did I keep did, am I paying attention to what's mm, yeah, going on? Exactly. Which is cool. I know people are into that, but not everybody is. And so for folks that aren't, snap it. Who cares? So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm making the I'm making a permanent switch to art. Yeah, as am I. I and it's going to blow your guys' mind because everybody, you know, despite me being an open source folk, think that I'm an Ubuntu guy. I run a lot of different operating systems, but my primary machine is no longer, you know, I've moved it off the netbook. My primary box right now yep. is Arch. Yeah, and I think so. I think new installs, like when we get around to the Raspberry Pi stuff, I'm going to go Arch on the Pi. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm just going to go Arch everywhere I can. Makes sense. Uh, I just... It allows you to do what you want to do. And, I, and what my intention is, is to do this as long as I can. Because you guys know yeah. me, I try to make switches sometimes and they don't always stick. Right. So I'm just going to talk about my experiences as I go. And I know a lot of you potentially hundreds of you have been thinking about doing the switch or making the switch. Right. I will be a living example every week. Uh, I'll come here and tell you if my arch box is still running. If, if it borks, I'll tell mm -hmm. you about that. I think one of the things I noticed during our trial here is there really is not a smooth path for new users to come to arch. As long as we're running arch, we want to make the Linux action show a little bit of that. Yes. So we're going to help you guys that are also making the transition just to try it out. We're not going to convert the whole show to it sure. all the time, no, but we're going to integrate it in more with our programming. Absolutely. Now. And, uh, the one last kind of thing before we move on to the last topic about Arch, I've noticed is I feel like this is going to sound really hippie. Well, I apologize <laughs> ahead of time. But Matt, I feel closer to upstream. Like it's yeah. pure, beautiful upstream code. It's right. how the developers intended it. It hasn't been modified. It hasn't right. been rethemed. It hasn't been renamed. Its icon hasn't been changed. The toolbars haven't been adjusted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It hasn't been reskinned. It is what the developers intended. That also means you ride a little closer to that to the potential bugs that they've introduced that sometimes distros smooth out. That's right. So you got to keep that in mind. Sometimes an arch bug isn't an arch bug, but it's just an upstream bug. Right? That's true. That's true. And you know, and another facet that really impressed me was, uh, especially from the Arch user repository, uh, Voca Screen. Uh, there is a there's a bug in that particular package to where it won't build. I looked into it again. I know I know nothing about Arch. I looked into this, you know, <laughs> and I discovered that it was actually a versioning issue. The the version of the package it's trying to pull doesn't exist. How and literally, I can go into the I can go into the actual the text file itself and actually make those changes. And then of course, I, the that's what's so nice. You, you got to be an advanced user to be able to do that. But if you are, yeah. you went in there and you were able to fix it. I was I was a dummy going in there and I was able yeah. to look at it. Now I have to re, I have to rebuild that. But it's the documentation's there. So I mean, I was able to determine the problem as a complete idiot. That's awesome. That is awesome. And I just called myself an idiot on air. I, I understand. <laughs> that's but also awesome. That's also awesome. You guys yeah. will love that. But that's that's <laughs> what was really cool. Doing that on other on other distros is kind of hitting miss mm -hmm. um you know and oh you know and just the way it handles it just it's just great i'm really a big fan of the packaging that's what really yeah me if, if you're a, so if you're maybe in the ubuntu world think yeah. of the packaging solutions in arch like if you could take any ppa in the world you want yeah. and integrate it in with your standard apt get setup because you can run tools on top of pacman like pack aur or aurora or yort yeah. which will install packages either from the official arch repos which are almost guaranteed to be solid yeah um, or from the community maintained repos that are essentially an index that can pull, you know, from GitHub. They can mm -hmm. pull from Launchpad. That's what blew my mind. It's yeah. Like, oh my god. I mean, it's like and it has just, every package. You just I've need ever to know wanted. the name. You yeah. just need to know the name. You go in yeah. there and you can from the command line. It'll go out and fetch it. It'll fetch all the dependencies. Right. I love it so much that I actually just in my toolbar here, I bookmarked the freaking AUR. So that yeah. way I'm like, hey, let's go see if that package is in there. And I am um, like, like humble bundle yep. stuff, like the humble bundle. Trine, let's say I search yeah. for Trine in here. There is scripts in here, yep. and you can sort by votes, which is very nice. Everybody can comment on stuff. So you can go find Humble Bundle games in here that just say, okay, give me the binary, and mm -hmm. then the script mm -hmm. takes care and installs everything else. That's Throughout right. my week of using Arch, I tried to do things that I would do under Ubuntu right. to see what would happen, like you know that new Humble Bundle. I exactly. downloaded those games, played them all. Steam played the hell out of Steam games this week. And, and, that and was the going fact crazy. that you, you didn't feel like you were limited based on this new experience. I mean, I, I've been excited the fact that I'm actually getting... I, I think my big one was... Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the app. It's a... Oh, it'll come to me later. But anyway, basically, it's a task app that I, I loved in Ubuntu, and it really wasn't available for OpenSUSE. And it was really frustrating because I could have built it from scratch, but that was it really wasn't 
you know, plausible at that yeah. point. And sure enough, there's in the Arch user repository, there it is. It's like, oh my God, this is awesome. How awesome is that? I was just like, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I've been I've been really surprised. You know, the way this system works is essentially anyone Nitro can make task, these anchor. package build scripts and then uh, submit them to the AUR and then people can vote on them and leave comments. Yep. And if something, so what I've learned to do is I'll just go in here and I'll just read the comments before uh, before I install something if I'm a little worried about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. okay, yeah, these guys say it is working. Or and that's good to do. Not. Believe yeah. me, that'll save you some headaches. And the other thing is like, you can also, you can get different versions of stuff. So like right. if I search for Dropbox, for example, right? That's where it got interesting. That's where I think your votes and your uh, popular. Yeah, you can see like this, this package of Dropbox has 3,400 votes, yeah. right? Where there's other versions like Dropbox Experimental has 379 votes. That's the one I'm using, or 285. I'm yeah, using. That's Drop what I used as well. Dropbox Experimental. Yeah, and I had great success with it. It was no problem. Yeah. A uh, couple hiccups with the uh, Jungle Disk, but actually, I think I know what I. I think I know where the problem is. Although it's not. Is the that comments. in there too? Yeah, Jungle. Oh, of course, jungle, it's Jungle Disk Desktop is what you'll. Uh, jungle. See if yeah, I just search yeah. for. Yeah, it'll, right there. Nautilus Jungle Disk. There's yeah. the integration piece. Oh yeah, no, do Jungle Disk Desktop because that, that's where I got jungle it. Jungle Disk Desktop. Uh, this, you know, regardless. No? Okay. Well, well, maybe they pulled it. Because, I mean, I, I got it. Maybe that's what happened. I found that I have to be pretty specific. So, like, it, if, if, it's I had like, problems, if it's yeah. like jungle disk, one word, it's dash, all one desktop, word. Yeah, yeah, try that. That's probably, that's I, probably I found it is a little. There's also the command line. No, there's no dashes option. or nothing. It's all one, oh, oh, one okay. thingy. That's what I'm screwing up. Well, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is, is I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised. There it is. I'm surprised by just the outrageous amount of software. Yeah. I mean, well, and Jungle I Disk is one of those apps too. If you're not using Ubuntu or, or very specific distro, sometimes you're looking at building it from, yeah. you know, they're building it the hard way. You know, Lightworks so. is in here too, which is oh, kind of my man, benchmark. Seriously, but I wasn't able to get it installed. Oh, uh, okay. No, it uh, now it's not in there. But they may have pulled it to fix. Uh, I don't know. I was like calling some sort. It was it was like dependent on a. So okay, here's yep. an example. Every now and there's a hiccup. Lightworks was dependent on a version of FFmpeg that is modified by Ubuntu. Because Ubuntu uh, modifies yeah. their version of FFmpeg, so Lightworks wrote their installer to expect that version. Right. I'll bet you, though, that they're, I'll bet you, and if it's not there, I'm sure it will be probably after the show, that someone's probably put that up in there somewhere. It's probably like a FFmpeg modified or something like that. I bet you it's probably there or will show up. And if it is, that's... Now, Sean you know. in the chat room brings up a great point, yeah. and I think it's something we should probably address, is that, you know, essentially, it's installing code that people have just posted on the internet. Yeah. Oh, no, it's absolutely as insecure and as not safe as a PPA. I would say it's very comparable to that. You are taking your life into your own hands and executing code you know nothing of. So that's, you think that's the, something to be Do you aware think of. the PPA is safer because it usually comes from the developer directly? No. I'll tell you why. The difference that I've noticed is I would say uh, I would compare the Arch uh, uh, user repository more to maybe a BitTorrent with its comments options because if someone's screwing up something or doing something malicious and it's caught, that comment's going to appear there. Yeah. With a PPA... Where? where? Where am I? I mean, are where, you going to so think... Which, are you know? saying PPAs are less secure? I think PPAs are less secure. Oh, I thought you were saying the opposite. No, 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 no. I think PPAs are less secure because, I mean, yeah, there's kind of a place to put some comments, but you're not going to think to look there. With the art with the art setup, it's like, it's going to be right there in front of you. It's like, hey, they just yeah. did blah, blah, blah. You're going to know or if something's it'll broken. Get, it'll get caught at least Yeah, faster. absolutely. And, uh, and I think enough people are really familiar enough with looking at code that they're going to, and of course you can look at your packages pretty closely because, you know, they do give you the option to actually look at what's going on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you know, like HW Killer points out in the chat room, mm -hmm. and this was definitely our experience with Simple Screen Recorder, is um, uh, a lot of times the people contributing to the AUR are the developers of that program themselves. Right. And, you know, That's one right. last thing about the community that I found, uh, because Arch, I feel like Arch sits much closer to Upstream. Right. Upstream is much more involved in Arch. In both the cases yeah. of PacUR mm -hmm. and Aurora and Simple Screen Recorder, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all of these developers submitted to AUR themselves and then also were following our weekly challenge and then, like, joined in the conversation threads sure. with us to give us some pointers and give us some advice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man, I was so, blown away by that. that was I, awesome. Like, how often have you been? Have, how often have you been struggling with an issue on your desk distro, and the developer of the package is actively following that community? Yeah. So it seems to be much closer to to uh, upstream and and all all together. I, I I feel like it's a little more true in that sense. I more, absolutely. Well, yeah. and like I was pointing out earlier with that uh, Nitro Task uh, Nitro Task uh, rather app, I was pointing out. I contacted the uh, developer and said, "Hey, I'm using OpenSUSE. You know, can you help me out?" And I never yeah. heard back. Thankfully, the community uh, put that together for Arch. I didn't have to worry about that. So that really is a kind of a differential. All right. So there so, you go. I interesting. Think, is there any other points we want to touch on? I really think that's the end of it. Uh, okay. We both switched to Arch. We both dig it. We yeah. both think that there needs to be uh, maybe, 
I don't know, almost a, an ambassador for new users. I mean, mm. the documentation's there, but it's very, you know, both the community and uh, there just needs to be kind of a go-between. And if you find, you know, you know I guess my part of your advice, if you find yourself wanting to switch to Arch and you run into some challenges, people would have to remember is when, you go to the, when you're going for help, you're yeah. already kind of in a bad spot because you're stuck, you're probably mm -hmm. a little frustrated. So when you get... When you get hostile responses, it can be it can be extra frustrating. Right. I would say try to let that go. Put your shields up. Right. You you know thick skin it. You might every now and then get a, a bad apple, but the rest of the orchards, spot on. Is that a good? Analogy? I think that's pretty good. Oh, right. One last thing: derivatives. Um, we didn't touch on that at all, and I think that oh yeah, of that's course. a big, big so the, thing. and also I a lot of issues in the arch community. I've gotten a dozen different answers, and yeah. they're very passionate and <laughs> and respins like arch bang and manjaro are definitely. Highly debated topics. Uh, I asked in my daily videos, what do you guys think of Archbang? Yes. Some people were like, oh, you know, I give Archbang away to somebody who maybe is a new user, but I still want to help them use Arch. Absolutely. And other people were like, I would never touch Archbang with a 10-yard 10 10 <laughs> pole because you never know what's on your Linux box. Right. Uh, some of the differences that I was able to determine without any opinion attached to them is that a lot of the concern is, of course, uh, which repos are being used. Um, is there going to be breakage? Uh, one, one of the developers for Arch, I believe is actually who he was, wrote an, a blog post about explaining the big gripe that he had was that if you're using like Manjaro or something of that sort, a lot of times you're using packages that are maybe a month old, mm. considered quote unquote stable. Um, mm. You know, which of course is debatable and based on opinion. That was his big gripe, but I definitely noticed an ounce of contempt. I personally don't think there's a wrong answer. I have a VM of Manjaro uh, installed, and it's, I'm going to be pretty, um, right? Yeah, it's very, very yeah. pretty, and I'm going to be running that as kind of a side by side. In I want to experience some of the negatives that Arch users have talked about, rather than just hearing about the the hoopla. I need to experience it before I'm really going to take that seriously because I need to see it break in the VM. I'm going to basically duplicate what I'm doing on my true install of Arch and see if I can experience some of that. I, the, like, I think it was a glib thing they pointed out once that was uh, Arch updated it and Manjaro wasn't caught up with it. Well, now Manjaro actually locks it into place. I actually checked on that. So, you know, I, Manjaro. I need... Manjaro. Manjaro. But yeah, I'm going to have to kind of play with it a little bit. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's okay to try what works for you, but I think there are definite so, differences. Like, here's a great example, you know? Matt. Uh, Lipsalon in the chat room is, uh, is, is very passionate. Yeah. He says, if you're sure, using sure. Archbang, you're not using Arch. She says. And that's a fair point. And you're not going to get support in the IRC. You won't get support in the forms. That's right. No, yeah. and I, and that and that's that's a valid point. You are literally using another distribution. Uh, it's a little yeah, bit like going Saint, to the Debian forums and asking for a bunch of support. This would be yeah. something interesting to play with. Sword Saint says you can replace Arch derivatives with meta packages on the AUR to set up the desktop. Oh yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, he says Riley said, and Riley points out Chris Lass. It was Archbang with Glibc break. Also, people have mentioned to me that. Um, during the transition yeah. to System D, people uh, that were using Archbang were caught a little flat-footed. Sure, I guess so. I guess you know if you want to yeah. try it out and you, and you and you just really are hung up on the installation, maybe do a derivative to see what all the hype is about. Right, run it for a for a few weeks and then just commit to yourself. I'm going to wipe this. And start fresh. Yeah, exactly. And that's really what it is. I what what turned me off is while I agree, if you're installing a derivative, you're using a derivative. You're not using Arch. We're on the same page there. And the do-it-yourself factor, my opinion, works great for me. I love that idea. I absolutely don't agree that it's for everybody. I think that's nonsense. But um, I think it's cool for me. And I also think that uh, you know, someone wants to use a derivative, don't harsh on them. Just say, you know, that's great. Not for me. I'm a do-it-myself kind of guy. Mm -hmm. You use a derivative. That's cool. It's much more palatable. Than it is, it is hate, funny you know, that Arch stuff. is so much silly. about choice. So, yeah. And then when you make the wrong choice, there yeah. are people like they're, they are now debating in the chat room <laughs> if it's elitist or not to, to not help people with Arch Bank. No, that's, it, I think that's perfectly reasonable. It's how, you, it's how you deny the help that matters to me. If you're being a jerk about it, then yeah, yeah you're not really making your point a very strong case. If you're saying, you know, I think that's great for you, but I'm not here to help you. That's okay. That's fine. Now, I just want to remind folks, you can go watch uh, our Switching to Arch yeah. videos over there. We, we had a lot of extra details on yeah. some of the applications. Um, I, I had a few things that I needed. It was fun because, you know, whenever you switch to a new desktop, especially one that doesn't yep. quite set everything up for you, there's little things here and there you need to fix. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's neat. Mm -hmm. I documented those fixes and that's stuff right. like that. It's been a very interesting challenge. I'm very glad we took it. I love the fact, uh, yeah, it's it's one of the best experiences I've had in a very long time. If you want a distribution to where you are taking responsibility for your desktop, mm. Arch is for you. Mm -hmm. If you want something that you're excited about building and excited about tweaking, Arch is for you. Yeah. If you want an out-of-the-box experience, a derivative is for you. Yeah. Just throwing that out there. There you go. I'd say that's the way to look at so. it. And I'm going to keep running it. We'll keep reporting back to you how, how it goes. If I break something... 
you see me sit down next week with Unity again, sure. <laughs> then you'll know. Also, I just want to say, also been, I really enjoyed my Gnome 3.8 experience throughout all of it, too. Yep, I'm committed. I, and I made a commitment to specific individuals, so I don't have an out. I, I'm sticking with it. I have to. I just That's what I have to do. A couple so. of quick dis- discussion threads before we wrap. Uh, along the, along the uh, theme of is it going to break, there is a conversation started by uh, uh, Basmer, Basmer, Basmar in, yeah, the, uh, in the subreddit, uh, and it's he's asking people what their experiences are. A lot of folks in here saying, "I've been using it for four years, right. three years. It's never broken on me, never broken on me." I think if you know how to revert packages, and you know, or or as an alternative, you just basically clone an image. But revert, you know, being able to revert from uh, individual packages is probably going to allow you to extend your life in it for years. I would imagine yeah. it makes that a lot easier. So that's a good thread to read. And then also, yeah. uh, Blackout Twenty Four created an art survival guide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he explains how to avoid breaking your system in the sure, first place. Sure. Walks through using Pac Man. Explains yep. what the AUR is. Awesome guide. Yes, linked in the show oh. notes. You guys go check this out. The forum section by itself is a must read. It really is because it's going to educate you and just how to better form etiquette in general. Yep, we have links to all those resources yes. in the show notes. But Matt, that wraps up the ARP challenge. Now we're just casual old arch users. <laughs> We're going to give away some Steam keys. We asked folks last week to send in some Let's Play. That's where you capture the video of you playing a video game mm-hmm. of a game you love that runs yes. under Linux that we just haven't given enough attention to on the show. we got some great submissions, Matt. So nice. get ready to give away some prizes. But I'm first, excited. I want to thank Untangle for sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Of course, Untangle firewalls work flawlessly once you have them installed. You can set it and forget it. Take, for example, the U-Series appliance. You can have that in your network in less than 10 minutes, even if you're not an expert in networking or even if you are. I've used these at clients. For example, at the main office, we'll have a uh, big Untangle box, a full-on right. server, because you, you can download the Untangle ISO for free. Sure, and just and, drop it into and place. And it just works. It. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it has a bunch of uh, stuff out of the box, works for totally free. And then you set up the big, powerful box at the main office. That's what I did, at least. And yeah. then out, out at the remote locations, you can use these little appliances because some of them are fan-free. They're oh, low power. Yeah, they right. fit perfectly in a rack. And a lot of times at clients, like remote locations, you just have a small rack. That's what's awesome. Or if they're at a home office, the the uh, U-Series appliances well, are really fantastic. And to really put it in perspective, the demo that they sent us, my wife was using it. Yeah, there you go. I'm just saying, she's she's you know she's not familiar with any of this stuff. She was like, hey, let's, you know, we really should really look at uh, setting this up. I like this intrusion protection kick. Yeah. It was that or, simple. Or you know, if, yeah. you're a, if you're a small business and you're struggling with yeah. some content issues. Maybe mm-hmm. it's social networks. Maybe it's, the, right. you know, I don't want to say what it could be. You know what I'm talking about, though. Yep. Untangle has superior content filtering capabilities to go far beyond most competitive products. Untangle Web Filter boasts over 450 million wow. sites in 140 categories, more than Barracuda, SonicWall combined. Nice. Loving yep. that. Yep. Use the code LAST20 if you want to grab yourself some services. Go download that ISO, try it out, and then if you want to turn on some really fancy stuff, go use LAST20 and you'll save 20% off your order. Visit Untangle.com slash LASS. They have links for the download right there. They got more information. Visiting Untangle.LASS helps support the show. So thanks everyone who visits Untangle and go check out how they're combining the power of Linux with ease of use. On Debian. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. All right. So we got a few submissions Yeesh. in our Let's Play. We're going to do uh, maybe a one or two more to give people a chance to right submit. On. First one comes from Canalot in the subreddit. So the terms are hmm. record a video. Okay. Upload it to YouTube. Okay. Link it in the subreddit. Seems reasonable to me. He says, uh, now this is from Kendall. He says, I tried to get the microphone volume correct. All I did was make sure you could hear my breathing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm props, also for props for trying. Props for trying. So he had, a, he had some technical difficulties. Sure. So the audio is a little hot. Okay. That's all right. We'll play a we'll, little we'll bit. We'll work with it. We'll play a little bit. Fine bundle. Bundle. All right, Camelot. Oh, here we go. Psychonauts. I haven't actually played Psychonauts yet, but it looks yeah. adorable. Yeah, it does. From the double fine bundle. Hmm. Jump ahead a little bit. Oh wow! Somewhere between these oh, I'd play that. Yeah. Very cool. That's Let's really jump neat. ahead and see a little more. So yeah, I, yeah. just but basically the idea was to give everybody a little taste of what these games are like. So I can a lot uh, picked a good one. Psychonauts is one that I've been wanting to see. But uh, all right. YouTube's not cooperating. YouTube's not cooperating. Yeah, and it did that to me yesterday too. It was just like, geez. It's been a thing. It's been, it's a, been thing. a thing. But uh, uh, so uh, Psychonaut. No, I'm not Psychonaut. Can a lot. Oh, yeah. it's kind of those, those kind of work. Together. They kind of sound, yeah. Check your uh, Reddit uh, messages later tonight. Yep, you'll have some information there about a Steam key. Shane Qful, friend of the show, creator of some apps for us, right on. Sent in the new Star Wars Jedi Knight port. Oh, I need to get on. Let's this. play the video. Play Star Wars, <coughs> as you can tell from my shirt. Going to play Jedi Academy, yeah. uh, which was recently released for Linux because of Raisin's release on the source code, which was very nice of them. 
It's coming to my attention. I need a double spot. Uh, I think he's drinking something right now. I think he's having a beer while he does. Oh, is he? Well, that's the way to do it, right? There you go. There we go. So there he is. Oh, yeah. Got a little play action Look, going. This is fun to watch. So there's Jedi Academy running on Linux. So Shane Q. Full, because I had yet to have seen that, you win yourself a Steam key. So uh, check your Reddit PMs for that. And then our last one, Matt, yes. uh, came in at the very last minute by Dark Keeper, a.k.a. Mm, Jeff, I believe. Good timing. And he submits a game you've never seen, he says. Okay. Hey, everyone. Jeff here, seen. and this is my mini there. Let's Play. That's right, mini. I just want to show some love to Love Games from the Love 2D engine. Runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows. It's all based on Lua, I guess. I'm no developer. I don't know. I just play them. The only Love Games I've found are from StabYourself.net. They have a Mario Portal mix. All right, now check this out. Mario with a zero there. This and is Mario for one. Portal. This is Mario Ortho Portal. Robot. Okay. And now he's going to get it started up. So the two games, he, now the rules, one. So he submitted a couple of games. Yeah. Ortho Robot also looks very awesome, but I'm not qualifying it. I only wanted one game. Right, right, but that's all right, because the game, the one game I am going to count is, look at him. He's an, he's an Arch, by the way. I was going to say, the, it looked like Arch both also yep. from the uh, launcher. See, he's Pac-Manning it right now. Oh, nice. So, Good touch. Uh, yeah, nice yeah. touch. Uh, like so check, it, check out this uh, Mario Portal game. So you know Mario, right? You, you know yourself some Mario. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet, but it is. And I'm going to be playing with mouse and keyboard. You need the mouse, definitely for the portal gun. From what I can tell, because I haven't beaten this, it is definitely all of Mario, or it seems like it's all of Mario, but with portal gun. Oh, uh, for you audio you listeners, go. he's now playing... Oh, no! He's right. now playing a Mario game so that includes a portal this. gun. That is so cool. This, that's how Mario should have happened in the first place. And he says it's basically the entire game. For me, game. this is that's awesome. devastatingly difficult. That's how, that's how Mario should have done in the first place. I'm just saying. Give me that NES controller. It's a whole different story. So, um, <laughs> this is an I'm awesome... Gonna, I'm going to check this out, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Mario fan, oh, yeah. so yeah. this is a great submission. This would definitely add a uh, needed refresh to our now watch. Experience. So he tries to get the flag. He tries to... Right. Oh, now, yeah. I see what he's doing. Did not mean to do that. Oh, that was an act. He didn't mean to oh, go he that died. Okay, okay. Okay, there he Whoa. goes. Okay. So now he's portaling. <laughs> so he's trying to... I want a better score. He's trying, to, he's trying to get the portal so that way he can get the flag. <laughs> of course, it doesn't quite work for him. <laughs> That's funny. I like this. Yeah. So this is definitely one to go check out. So <laughs> Jeff... I uh, looked out of it. Check your uh, check your Reddit PMs uh, later tonight after I get the show posted, and uh, yes. I'll have uh, more information on getting a Steam game out to you. Uh, I I love I love the idea of combining like an old retro game like Mario right. with a new game like Portal. Uh, That's so cool. It speaks to me, Matt. Wasn't there a Mario Metro Metroid thing? <gasps> That would have been just off the hook, because then you just dust everything. You don't. Oh care. my gosh! If that's a thing, blah, blah, if that's a blah. if that's a thing, I might have. I, I might not ever do a show again. I might just be playing games. <laughs> uh, so cool that all all three submissions included audio of themselves. That was great. Yes. So these let's play videos are just a way we're trying to get more exposure to games we've never seen, never really, never really talked about yeah. on the show. That was those were some awesome examples. All three of you guys. Absolutely. We'll be getting some Steam keys. Uh, just uh, check your Reddit PMs. And now, if you would like to submit a game for next week's consideration, I think we'll do one more giveaway, maybe two. Okay. Two. Maybe two. Two. Maybe two. If okay. we get two good ones. All right. Uh, send them to, uh, upload them to YouTube, record them, and you could use that simple screen recorder app right. that we made our pick today. Uh -huh. You see the connection there? Uh -huh. Upload it to YouTube. And the great thing about simple screen recorder, it'll record right to a file that goes on YouTube. And then link it in our subreddit and uh, make sure we see it. And then uh, we'll play it on next week's show. Yep. So that was, uh, just to recap, uh, that was uh, Psychonauts. And voice is optional. If you can't get that to work, don't worry about it. But it's fun. Man. It's fun, but I'm just saying it's not yeah. like the end of the world. I mean, as long as we got the gameplay and it's something yeah, cool. You know? right. You're right. You're right. I'm just saying, because not everybody can get the voice no, thing. You're right. Working. So that was uh, Psychonauts and Jedi Academy. Yes. And then the, Mario, uh, the name of the Mario Portal game. I didn't get it. It was. Uh, it uses the love engine, so you got to yeah. start with that. You can dig in there. Of course, we have it linked all in the show notes. So you I guys got me a love engine. Stuff. Yeah. Right. Thanks, you guys. Cool. All right, Matt. That wraps up. Slash Etsy. That just about brings us to the end of the Arch Action Show. But Matt, before we get out of here, yes, thought maybe we'd cover some of our action emails. I'd like to hear some. Okay. All right. First one comes from Steve. He says, hey, guys, for the love of computers, do a review of Manjaro Linux. I decided to give it a shot the other day, and I'm convinced that it's an easy to use as Mint and about three times as fast. 
Yeah, I'd say so. I installed it on an ancient spare drive, 20 gigabytes, and I'm so impressed that I'm going to move the install to my main Linux drive. I'm using the KDE variety. It comes pre-packaged with the latest Steam already installed, yes. as well as automatically installs the latest NVIDIA driver. The default package selection themes are wonderful. I would describe Manjaro as the Linux mint of Arch. I've installed XFCE variant and a VM and absolutely love it as well. Anyway, here's a quick clip, and we'll have a link to this clip in the uh, in the um, show notes. Cool. Where he walks us through it. I really think this is the answer. Ubuntu is going sideways, and even though I love Mint, I'm stunned at the speed and stability of Manjaro. You do definitely get some uh, definite advantages, uh, as other folks pointed out. It is it's much like Mint is to Ubuntu. They're very different uh, mm -hmm. situations, very very different uh, philosophies and everything else, and whatnot. But yeah, it's it's very it's very sexy looking, and it is rather fast. At least it was in the VM for when I tried it. Yeah, now we talked about this in the, yeah. in the uh, Arch segment. Uh, there's definitely some disadvantages to using one of these offshoots of Arch. Right. I maintain, though, and I, I know these guys that are listening think I'm crazy, but I maintain, I think you could look at that, you could use that and go, oh, holy crap, Arch can be amazing. And then it inspires you to start from scratch. It shows you, because there's a lot of people that just have this barrier about that install. Right. And it shows you that... It is worth it. It is worth it. I, I think I think we got a we got a new license now because because we're arch users, we can talk we can talk the way we feel. Pow. See, now we we've owned it, so we're there. So that's we can true. now as arch users say, you know, that's okay too. Not yeah. for us, but yeah. you know, you want to use Manjaro, that's awesome. Yeah. Who cares? Next email comes from Steve. He says, I've been a Linux user on and off since Ubuntu six oh four and I really want to switch mm -hmm. permanently away from Microsoft, but every yep. single distro lets me down one way or another. Mm -hmm. I was always a fan of Mint, and then I left it around Gloria, and I came back, and still not happy. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. no reason for other than always something lets me down with every distro I chose. I thought this time with Mint 15, I was ready to make a permanent switch. I also got my family set up on Linux, too, but after three days, I found the issue, which is a showstopper for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. iTunes. I have an iPhone. It says don't hate him for that. No, I, I had one for a long time, I understand. And so do most members of his ex extended family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm willing to give up on using iTunes in favor of a different music player, but I can't, as right. nothing I've tried can access the music on my phone, not to mention backing up the apps. Right. I thought Banshee was going to be my savior when I saw the phone pop up in the sidebar, but only 16 of the 200 songs could be found. The only advice I've gotten is get a different music player, but that's not good enough. I can't well, tell my entire yeah. family that if they want to switch to Linux, then they need to, you know, well, and, and everybody, and, and of course, you're going to run into folks that are, you just need to get another, and, and the thing they're not understanding is you're basically saying, hey, entire family, change your entire user experience, which right. isn't real practical. Uh, boy, you know, that's that that's going to be a tough one. Um, you, I have with limited success uh, with, I think it was actually back when I still had an iPhone, I was running a Windows VM, and uh, I think it was with VirtualBox, and I was basically doing it that way, strictly oh, with for With USB up, yeah, connected? Yeah, strictly for mm. updates. I didn't do music that way. That sounds way. clunky. I, it is horrible. I know clunky. Crossover has like yeah. a, a wizard to get oh, no, iTunes running worse. into one. Yeah. Way worse. You're, I mean, like, it actually works in v the VM, but with, with wine and all that, ugh, it's really I think bad. I think Steve's same yeah. problem that he has right now is going to be the same problem he's going to have on the Mac yep. in about a year or so. It is. I want to tell you about this thing called iCloud. Oh. Apple is transitioning you away from using a tethered USB cable from your phone to your Mac. They don't want you doing this anymore. And they are very close to dropping this all together. They want you to sync your music via iCloud. They want you to sync your apps via iCloud. They want you to sync your photos via iCloud. And they're going to move you that way, Steve. So eventually, Apple is going to also create this problem for you on the Mac platform. I know it sounds crazy now, but mark my words. Yeah iCloud. So this is a problem you need to solve either way. Right Now, I don't necessarily have the ideal solution for you, but I would suggest potentially looking into using iCloud to update and back up your phone. You can use iCloud for that. To look at using iCloud to sync your photos. It'll sync to a web gallery. I don't know how sure. you would get them on the Linux box from there, but potentially there's something. Yeah, yeah. You, you're going to... I think the, the bigger picture is is that when you're using certain devices, you're generally locked into the ecosystem that they work with. And so if, you're, if you are an iPhone user, you're going to find that that's something you're going to have to contend with. I mean, there's really no way around it. Mm -hmm. As an ex-iPhone person at some point you're just going to have to decide to either cut the cord and make the move to yeah. android or not well, i mean it's i really, would argue you know, too that the experience isn't necessarily this particular yeah. problem isn't solved with android there's not a great syncing solution for android either i i have solved my android syncing problem by using amazon and google music yeah. and all my music is stored in the cloud Sure. Uh, right. My photos I do via Dropbox and Google Plus Instant Upload. That's how I sync my photos. Right. And my contacts are done via Google's inherent syncs process that's built into Android. 
I don't ever well, take yeah. my Android phone and plug it in via USB to sync anything. I do. Right? I, 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 as far as like to, to, a, to an SD card, yeah. I oh, mean, okay. It's, it's really not that big a deal. I mean, you can use... You sure, know, I can see that. But now, but I'm you're saying, not going to do that with an iPhone. But do you, you sync know? it with a media jukebox? Yeah. You do. And, and it just writes like a Re- uh, Yeah, it, it literally it treats so it like a thumb That would solve the music problem. Yeah, that solves the music problem. What about photos? Photos, honestly, clouding it, I think, is probably yeah. where you're at. Um, if you're looking maybe at like an Ubuntu situation or something like that, so you if could you do an used, Ubuntu one. if you used Google Music yeah. or Amazon Music, you probably wouldn't. You would probably wouldn't sync your Android device. Good, yeah, so working with Google Music is it, uh, with Android or any OS yeah, is not painful. Great. It's yeah. horrible. I don't know um, it either. It's absolutely hideous. Amazon Music's not as bad. No, it's not as bad. But, but yeah, but it's a little funky. Uh, yeah, you know, you're gonna have to just kind of toy around with different options as far as the or, photos are concerned. That's gonna I be tough. Wonder if you rooted. And then if, because I know if you root it, you can get access to the file system. That might be. And then you could mount it on your Linux box and just copy crap in and out. Okay, so basically what you're saying is like you would with the music and the SD card, you would be with it rooted, you could essentially do the same thing with photo and a photo manager. Yeah, I think, could, maybe, Potentially, right? right? Chat room can chime in, obviously, yeah. but yeah. This is a challenge. It's something we'll investigate. Yeah, yeah it's sure. something we do need to solve because it's a yeah. question we get a lot. It's a fair point. KM Broadcasting writes in, Hi, Chris and Matt. I was wondering if you guys know any good video intro software under Mac, Windows, or Linux, for example... How Chris made his Plan B intro. Mm. Also, if there's any Raspberry Pi users that watch the show, send them to bit.ly slash pie draft. He's going to do a Raspberry Pi podcast. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Hmm. So, you know, like boy, motion boy, graphics, boy. Blender yeah. is like going to be, you know, you can do a lot with Blender. The, okay. There needs to be like a like a video professor for that, man, because it's just like really the, intense. After Effects on Linux super yeah. hard. And, yeah. and the, the issue isn't just what Blender is or is not capable of. Right. The problem is, is unless you are going to create something from whole cloth, you yeah. need to start with a template you're probably going to buy. That's usually yeah. what I do is I, I have a starting point, mm. and then I take that and I customize it. So the templates that I try to buy are just specifically designed to be completely customized, to remove assets, to add assets, yeah. to change everything about them. Yeah, to, exactly. And that saves probably five, six hours of time. I, I think the only workaround I can see, because there's not a marketplace like there is for After Effects to where you can go and buy those templates for Blender, at least that I know of anyway, um, you might end up having to outsource, uh, say, put up a thing on like Elance or whatever and say, hey, look, you know, I need some Blender templates made. Can yeah. you hook me up? That's, that's probably your best a, bet. You know, that's not a bad idea at all. And then you yeah. could do it inside Blender. Yeah. That, and, and then you can import it and, and learn some of the tweaking basics you're safe because it's point. a little less uh, intense. So. I want to give a quick shout out. We've gotten, uh, okay. So we just covered like four or five emails we got like a hundred and something emails this week. You guys were super fired up. I'm sorry we cannot answer all of them, but a right. couple of you guys sent in this link. Uh, several of you sent in this link. Save podcasting mm-hmm. from the EFF. Uh, you've probably heard that there is uh, a patent troll. He's going after uh, right now. He's going after Adam Carolla, the Discovery right. Network. I guess they've sent letters to several other podcasting networks who have not been disclosed. Jupiter Broadcasting, as of yet, is not one of them. Okay. Uh, but they're essentially going after media that is distributed via an RSS with right. the with the uh, you know where you can embed a, a media right. file in RSS, the enclosure tag. Uh, so the EFF is taking this on. They're trying to raise funds. I want to make you guys aware of this. I believe they've reached their funding goal. But this is something we obviously have to keep. We have a, we all have a, a shared interest in watching yeah. this very closely because this is serious stuff. Uh, this guy is going after the fundamental way podcasts are distributed. They don't own any. They they're just like an IP holding company. They're yeah. not in the industry. They've bought up. They bought up a patent, and now they're using it to. They sue basically people. live in the courtroom. I mean, that's really what they do. It's, 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 it's absolutely argue and fight. Yeah. It's absolutely atrocious, yeah. and it's a complete abuse of the system. We've seen it. We've seen how it has hindered uh, innovation in the mobile industry, in the computer industry. Now they're going after podcasting. It's disgusting. It's disgraceful, and I hope we can help stop it because it is an entirely new generation of broadcasting that is responsible only to its audience. It is perhaps the most pure and important type of media that is out there yep. because it is not commercialized, it is not perverted, right. and to have it killed off by a patent troll would be a dramatic, dramatic blow to the community. So uh, let's all keep an eye on this, and I'll keep you guys posted on it as well. And the uh, link we'll provide provides a donation page for the uh, that will help the EFF go and, uh, yeah. and, and deal with these guys and actually confront them and give them the tools they need to uh, do their part. Sir, yes, sir. All right, Mr. Matta, what are you up to this week? I know you got a few things going uh, on. A couple things. Uh, yeah. As always, you can find me at datamation.com. Scroll down to open source. Find me there. Uh, also, a uh, long time, uh, long, long time buddy, uh, Chris Perillo, uh, has actually got an event happening in Seattle called Vloggers Fair. 
And that is going on, I believe it's going to be June 8th or somewhere in that space. So Vloggers Fair, uh, we'll have the link in the show notes. He's actually looking to get some Linux folks to attend specifically in the Seattle area because oh, awesome. he's got some he's got a little surprise for you guys. I can't I'm I'm under NDA, I can't say what it is, but I can tell you that you want to be there. It's uh, a big name in the Linux industry and it's going to be cool. And so you you kind of want to be there. So it's something to look into. Um, I'll talk to Chris a little bit about it after the show, but Oh it's, man. But uh, it, it's it's something I think we pro- we probably uh, I've been asked to be there. Um, uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, yeah, so it's something to check out. Vloggers Fair, I forget the URL. I think it's vloggersfair.net or dot. I'm sure if you if yeah. you just Google it, you'll Google find Perillo it. and, and yeah, Vloggers Vloggers Fair. Net, yeah. or Vloggers Fair or whatnot. So anyway, yeah, look for the URL. We'll have it in the show notes. Check that out. So yeah, definitely cool, cool stuff. Your Linux guy, Seattle area, be there. All right, I've got something oh. exciting. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Coda Radio is live on Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern over at JBLive.tv. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. tomorrow will be our one-year episode 52. Wow. All in a row. All in Dude, a row wow. of Coda Radio. A year of Coda Radio should be a good show. I'm sure uh, yep. Michael's going to harass me about his fancy new HTC oh, One. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably have to buy one right there on air. <laughs> Always <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, totally. So go check out uh, Coda Radio tomorrow. It'll be released tomorrow afternoon for download. Probably be a fun show. You know he's going to send you an animated GIF, right? Going. <laughs> I think I think it has software on there to do like <laughs> animated petting his phone. Yeah, it's got like some sort of HTC software on there to do that. Uh, we also love to hear yep. from you. You can email the show Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Better place even is the subreddit. Yep. We're there a lot more often. LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. Yep, yep, yep. You can also hit the contact link at the top of our show. There Yeesh. you go. So there it is. This completes the Arch Action Show. We'll be back with the Linux Action Show next Sunday, every single Sunday. And we're live on, on uh, J- at jblive.tv, Sundays, 10 a.m., which is 1 p.m. Eastern, which I believe is 6 p.m. GMT. Right? Sounds good to me. Yeah. I think I got all Get that confused, right. Google it. Yeah. Figure it out. We, we love to have you join us live because you can hang out in our chat room and tell yeah. us how uh, we're a bunch of uh, spazzes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We like to be spaz. <laughs> you know, well, just saying. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Arch Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> you know, this show is actually a secret operation of the it New is. World Order. That's right. We're actually headquarters. Yeah, well, we're just keeping you distracted. <laughs> I've entered the Galaxy S4 system where I'm going to probably break down and buy a new phone very soon. <laughs> And he's going to do so on a Picard board. Lieutenant Commander Data tells me that I should probably get the S4. However, I tell him I think I prefer the build quality of the HTC One. <laughs> so, for, for plan B, I decided I'd barbecue some steaks that I bought with Bitcoin. So, this is for plan B, but... so uh, it Looks like a plan A to me, man. I roasted, yeah, <laughs> I roasted some garlic. So, yeah, I got chopped garlic and then garlic cloves on there. And then a uh, little uh, sweet potatoes with uh, some uh, some butter on there. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know the number one comment we're going to get now is, now you guys need to do a week in uh, Gen 2. Oh, no. Uh, what was uh, the other day? Oh, I, wonder was, uh, if we, I wonder if we might have DDoSed them a little bit. Crunch bang. I think we might have DDoSed them a little bit. Oh, no, really? <laughs> well... <laughs>